Hello, everybody, and uh, good evening. Welcome to this session on automated analysis of private communications in relation to detecting and preventing child sexual abuse material. So the context of this, as you probably know, is an increased ability of technology to look into private messages and detect, um, in this case, um, child abuse material. This is something that, as far as I know, was pioneered by America Online in 2004, has something that's become much more sophisticated in the intervening time. And it's something that's become the source of increased controversy in Europe at the moment, particularly in light of the European Electronic Communications Code, which, as I'm sure you know, extends the provisions of the Privacy Directive to over-the-top services and threatens to disrupt scanning mechanisms that certain web services and internet messaging services already have in place. I'm delighted to say that we have with us today a stellar lineup um, of individuals to discuss this, starting with Katrin Barabost, who is head of unit for the fight against cybercrime and child sexual abuse in DG Migration and Home Affairs of the European Commission. And her unit develops the legislative proposals and policy in this area um, and coordinates EU efforts in relation to cybercrime generally. We have then Mallory Nodell, who is the Chief Technology Officer of the Centre for De uh, Democracy and Technology, who co-chairs the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group at the Internet Research Task Force, um, and is an advisor to 33 government members of the Freedom Online Coalition. Next, with the European Data Protection Supervisor's Office, we have Dr. Brendan Vaughan Alsonloy, who is Deputy Head of Unit with for policy and consultation. And prior to taking up his role in the EDPS, he was a legal advisor at the Belgian Data Protection Authority and a legal researcher at the KU Leuven Centre for IT and IP Law. We then have Diego Naranjo, who is the head of policy at European Digital Rights, um, which is a group of digital um, and electronic rights organisations from across Europe, um, who has previously worked in the context of the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, and the Free Software Foundation of Europe, as well as being a qualified lawyer in Spain. And to round it up, I myself am a Associate Professor in the School of Law in University College Dublin and Chair of the Civil Rights Group Digital Rights Ireland. So I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion today. And without further ado, we will go straight to Catherine. Catherine, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, TJ, and thanks for having me as part of this uh, stellar lineup. That's a very uh, nice introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be part of this important conversation, and I think also recent events at the Capitol and also during the U.S. elections more generally have launched a more general societal debate on the role of platforms in society. Um, so I'm really glad to have a chance to discuss this very particular aspect of it with you today. Now, um, protecting children and countering child sexual abuse uh, are top priorities for the European Commission. And last July, um, as you may have seen, the Commission put forward a comprehensive strategy for a more effective fight against child sexual abuse. One part of that strategy focuses on the online aspect of these crimes. And as TJ was already alluding to, um, offenders from around the globe who would never have known each other in pre-internet times now can freely chat at no cost. They can exchange photos and videos, trade techniques for grooming children into abuse, and they can even incite each other to new abuse. Um, and on electronic commu communications networks, they form chat groups with dozens, hundreds, and at times thousands of individuals. Often, the evidence of abuse shared in these exchanges is the only way to find and help the victims who are frequently unable to seek help themselves until years and sometimes decades after the abuse. So industry, therefore, has a crucial role in the fight against child sexual abuse. The providers of platforms can detect, prevent, and report child sexual abuse on their services. A number of companies, um, as TJ has said, object to the abuse of their services by criminals and have set rules for the use of their platforms accordingly. They prohibit their users from sharing such content or for, from grooming children using their services and enforce this policy by detecting child sexual abuse on their services. Uh, for this, they use technologies that can be compared to those employed to detect spam and malware, 
um, comparing known signatures of child sexual abuse images or using algorithms that detect and flag possible new child sexual abuse images and videos for review. The technologies in particular for known content have been in use for years and are fairly reliable. Where the companies confirm the detection of child sexual abuse, they report it to a central hotline, which verifies and refers the reports to national law enforcement in the appropriate jurisdictions. Unfortunately, these reports show a strong increase in child sexual abuse detected. For the EU alone, we went from 23,000 reports in 2010 to more than 725,000 reports in 2019, uh, which included more than 3 million images and videos. The initial figures for 2020 show a further rise of 31% compared to the previous year, um, surely in part due to the pandemic. About two thirds of these reports stem from electronic communication services, such as messaging and email. These reports over the years have been instrumental in rescuing children in the EU and elsewhere from ongoing abuse. And they were at the outset of several of the big investigations currently being carried out in EU member states. However, as of 21st of December, providers of messaging and email services fall within the scope of the e-privacy directive due to the expansion of scope of the European Electronic Communications Code to some over-the-top services. They therefore no longer have a legal basis to continue their voluntary detection. As a result, we have already seen a 46% decrease in the number of reports since the 21st of December. Now, this problem is not new, and there had been a discussion about whether to address it already during the e-privacy negotiations. However, as these, as you probably all know, are still ongoing, last September, the Commission took the unusual step of proposing interim legislation. Now, this interim legislation aims to maintain the then existing legal framework for providers of online communication services only for when it comes to voluntary measures to detect and report child sexual abuse online. Um, this interim legislation proposal is limited, both in scope and in duration. And it essentially sets out a temporary derogation from Articles 5.1 and 6 of the e-privacy directive. It does not create a new legal basis for such activities, so companies would have to rely on a legal basis under Article 6 of the GDPR and the Commission has not taken a position on the legality of any such activities, which of course do need to comply with the requirements of the GDPR. Now, this approach, as you probably know, is not without its critics. Some say that the Commission should have immediately put forward a legal basis and possibly considered an obligation if this detection was so important. And this is something that we plan to consider for a long-term instrument that we will put forward in the summer. The current proposal that we're discussing today only seeks to preserve the status quo, adding safeguards on top of the GDR, GDPR for a limited period to allow the time to conduct the necessary assessments and propose uh, a more long-term legislation. Now, as you may also know, we're getting a lot of heat from many sides on this. Child protection organizations say not enough is being done. Others, including probably some on the panel here, think this goes too far already. But let me now give them a chance to express that criticism, and I hope to have a chance to react to that later. So let me just close with the next steps um, so you all know where this might be headed. We're currently in trilogues, so in discussions between the European Parliament and the Council um, on the interim proposal from the Commission, which we hope to conclude fairly soon. Um, and the long-term proposal, once again, is planned to be put forward this summer. Allow me just to remind you that this is only a small part of our efforts against child sexual abuse. We're also launching a prevention network. We support a number of important projects in the member states and we promote the position of national rapporteurs on child sexual abuse. Um, as part of the long-term legislation, we also plan to put forward um, a, the suggestion of setting up a center, a European center to combat child sexual abuse, which would support detection efforts by companies, um, but also uh, invest significantly in pre prevention and assistance victims. I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, our next speaker is um, Mallory Nodell, and Mallory has a very interesting perspective to offer here, not least because the 
systems that we're talking about in relation to detection of child sexual abuse material um, were developed initially in the United States, where there's a much more formalized scheme in place, um, including um, a body, the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, that acts as an intermediary between the government and the internet service in relation to these kind of reports. So Mallory, the floor is yours. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I work It doesn't appear that I'm muted. Can you hear me now? Great, yeah. Um, so I was just saying that I'm, I work for the Center for Democracy and Technology as the chief technologists. We're based here in the US in Washington, DC, but we also have an office in Brussels. Um, and CDT's mission is really to um, defend human rights and advocate in the public interest in the digital age. Um, and so to that end, I've also worked for many years on uh, the technical aspects of these proposals. So I have lots of colleagues on the policy side and I think what I can offer um, for you today is also a look in, at what is being proposed technically, because I think that's really important to understanding what are the limitations. And in this case, I think um, the power actually that it would give to uh, governments, agencies, especially law enforcement agencies. So with that, I'm going to speak about this issue in three parts from my perspective. Um, first, trying to break down exactly what is being asked for. We've heard about encryption backdoors uh, for a long time. And how does this new, how do these new proposals fit within this old discussion? Uh, the second part I want to actually try to explain as best I can in clear language, what are the technical proposals? And then lastly, my analysis of um, what these proposals are and how good they are and what are we worried about? So first, um, we are seeing a change in what's being requested. But previous um, debates about this issue have simply asked for backdoor access, uh, which is just, you know, a shorthand for being able to look inside encrypted messages. Um, but now we're seeing a proliferation of requests by agencies. They don't just want the backdoor access, I think they're going further than they have in the past. So one trend we've seen um, is that they want some traceability, which to me sounds just like an increased um, metadata, where secure messaging apps are trying to reduce metadata so that they can improve user privacy. Um, law enforcement agents would like more of it so that they can, um, you know, more easily put people behind bars or um, verify the, the evidence that they've collected, that sort of thing. Um, another that is being asked for is sort of access in perpetuity. Um, so, you know, you can see all the contacts, all the, all, because you can't see the inside the messages. Um, if you just picked one message at random, you might not get the information you want. You actually need to get a whole bunch of messages to sort of build evidence um, and to peek inside. So it's not just one message. And that also then proposes um, a new, introduces a new issue from a technical perspective called linkability. So a lot of these secure messaging apps are trying to delink uh, people from their messages and their messages from themselves. Um, this requires then there to be strong linkability between messages and between the user and the messages. Um, another thing that's being requested is the ability to build a case. So if you're going to try people, if you're going to follow behavior and um, you know understand how an, an online network is influencing other people, you actually need past, present, and potentially future access to um, messages. And that is something that's going to violate a technical design constraint called forward secrecy. So that something, if you have access to my messages today, you wouldn't necessarily have access to them from last year. And then the last one that I think we're seeing now is that not only are we trying, are agencies trying to get access to the content, they're trying to prevent certain types of content from being uh, proliferated online. So that's a blocking and filtering feature. Um, and so you can see how this isn't just a backdoor, actually it's a whole set of um, very particular features that are at, in, they're, they're completely paradoxical to some of the design uh, goals that a secure messaging app 
uh, would have. Um, and so if I could just go through, and I, I'm hoping that my audio doesn't go out. All right. It's incredibly difficult for me to, um, I have to check notes, but I'm unable to do that. So I'll do my best to, to, to talk off the cuff. So some of the things that we're seeing proposed as far as technical uh, alternatives to a simple encryption backdoor are things called client-side scanning, which means that you essentially turn um, an end-user device into, um, you know, the, that's where that's where the computation is happening. So uh, if we're talking about end-to-end -end encryption, obviously that definition means we want um, the sender and the recipient to be the two endpoints and that the server and no intermediaries in between have access. So client-side scanning essentially takes that design constraint and says, okay, well then we turn this, the endpoints into where uh, computation um, or revealing the data happens, right? Um, the problem is, is that there are several problems with the maybe four or five different um, examples we've seen is that any, even, even sort of partial hashing, meaning like, you know, you don't really scan the entire image or the entire message, but you compare a, a mathematical derivation of that content with, uh, you know, a database of known um, uh, problematic content. Even that is going to require quite a bit of computation on an end user, an end user device. Um, and as we know, we already have a lot of accessibility constraints and not all end user devices will be able to handle that kind of um, computation. Um, another kind of, um, there are other problems with it, which I'm going to save that for the last part of my um, delivery. Then the, the other sort of bucket of things that are being proposed in addition to the original idea of backdoors and then client-side scanning is something called um, secure enclaves or, or um, you know, essentially uh, co computation that's happening in some kind of third-party server. So away from the uh, two endpoints and somewhere in the middle, but without actually peeking inside um, how you can maybe do computation on um, the, the, the content that's still encrypted. So you're not disrupting the encryption, you're not actually having access, but you're doing things to it mathematically, you know, to do a similar thing, to compare, you know, known content um, against uh, what people are sending to one another. Um, and they have very similar uh, they have very similar issues. So let me please, if I could go into the reasons why I think um, there are, uh, you know, better solutions um, to this or why um, this could be even worse. Um, and for that, you're just gonna have to allow me to try to um, bring up um, my notes without disrupting my audio. It'll just take one extra second. There we are. Thank you. Right. So, um, what the main issues with all of these uh, proposals, and I'll try to wrap up really quickly, is that they, of course, do undermine the security and privacy of private messaging services. As you can see, if we're, we've already got um, a whole set of very difficult problems to solve to make messaging as private as it possibly can be, but we have conflicting and numerous and extraneous feature requests that's going to put a heavy burden on uh, the developers and at times actually create situations that cannot actually be resolved to make everyone happy. Um, it, it also is something that I found in some of the technical suggestions that I've read is that there's not any difference between the sort of child sexual abuse images or m media that people want to filter out and any other kind of, of content. So I've also spent a lot of my career as a technologist thinking about censorship and censorship uh, circumvention. Um, and this really opens the door to um, limitations to freedom of expression and censorship because there's nothing uh, that would stop other kinds of databases of other kinds of content, you know, from, from also being treated in the same, in the same way. Um, I've already spoken about how many uh, user devices are in low connectivity environments in particular are not going to be able to handle uh, suggestions like uh, client-side scanning. Um, and then I think as well, just, uh, and this is for others to think about, and as a technologist, I'm only offering my opinion, but you know, if we're only focusing on um, known content, there then is the problem of how to handle new content. Um, you know, we heard in, from the first um, speech that 
there's a lot more than just content going around online. It's actually a community of organization, like it's organization online, it's networking. Um, there's really no way to prevent that without having a very heavy hand in uh, censorship. Um, and the, these methods at the end of the day may just not be very effective in what is essentially a social problem, um, but it would in fact um, really tarnish the ability of everyday users to securely communicate with their banks, their doctors, their lovers, their friends. And that is ultimately what we're very worried about um, in civil society and at CDT in particular. Um, and there's a group of us that are seeing these proposals crop up in many, many different countries around the world. And so we've sort of joined forces uh, to call ourselves the Global Encryption Coalition. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks and apologies for going over time. Uh, Great. Thank you very much, Mallory. Um, very interesting presentation, not least because your comments about um, function creep um, echo my experience. I wrote my doctoral thesis a number of years ago on the United Kingdom's internet filtering scheme called CleanFeed, designed to prevent uh, child abuse images being accessed by internet users. And that scheme was not in existence a wet weekend, as we say in Ireland, before it had been co-opted by the copyright industry for the purpose of blocking file sharing sites. So obviously um, a real concern in this context. Um, next up, we have um, Brendan von Alsnoy, who will give us, I believe, a specifically data protection perspective on these proposals. Brendan, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you very much, TJ, and thank you very much also to the to the previous uh, speakers for their interesting interventions. I'm going to touch on a few things uh, that they raised, but I'm merely going to focus on the opinion that the EDP issued last November in relation to the Commission's recent proposal for a temporary derogation from the e-privacy directive. So, from the outset, I want to make perfectly clear that the EDPS fully supports the fight against sexual abuse online. Child sexual abuse is a particularly abhorrent crime and the measures to combat, to combat this crime can justify an interference with fundamental rights, including the rights to data protection and privacy. But any derogation from confidentiality of communications needs to be carefully considered and it also needs to be limited to what is strictly necessary. This is not just the view of the EDPS, but it's also the view of uh, the European Court of Justice. A second important consideration in this debate, and I think uh, Catherine briefly alluded to this in her um, initial remarks, is that the Commission's proposals raises questions which are not specific to the fight against child sexual abuse, but they're actually common to any initiative aiming at collaboration of the private sector for law enforcement purposes. We also need to keep in mind that even voluntary measures by private companies can constitute an interference, especially when they lead to proactive detection of criminal activities and reporting to law enforcement. So the Commission's proposal, in our view, ultimately raises fundamental questions regarding rule of law, the role of technology and governance. Now, I won't have time to get into each of the specific recommendations we made in our opinion, but I do want to highlight a few points. The first concerns the need to ensure necessity of proportionality. Different technological tools can be used to detect child sexual abuse, but those techniques have different levels of intrusiveness. For example, there is a qualitative difference between the automated analysis of images or videos to match against previously confirmed or similar instances of child pornography versus automated analysis of speech of text with a view of identifying potential instances of child solicitation using keywords. And while the former may be proportionate in our view, provided additional safeguards and uh, legal and technical safeguards are put in place, we have far more serious concerns regarding the latter. That's why in our opinion, the EDPS stated that general indiscriminate and automated analysis of all text-based communications with a view of identifying potential new infringements does not respect the principles of necessity and proportionality, even if the technology used is limited to the use of relevant key indicators. The second point I'd like to make concerns the rule of law. In its proposal, uh, uh, the Commission carried out that, uh, uh, clarified that carrying out a DPIA, data protection impact assessment, uh, may be necessary. And both in the Council and in the European Parliament, we've seen proposals uh, for amendments to make this mandatory, including also uh, prior consultation with data protection authorities. Now, DPIAs are powerful tools. But guidance by data protection authorities cannot substitute compliance with the requirement of legality. It's insufficient to provide that the temporary derogation is without prejudice to the GDPR and to mandate prior consultation. The co-legislator, in our view, must take its responsibility 
to ensure that the proposed derogation complies with the requirements of Article 15 of the Privacy Directive as interpreted by the CGU. This is why it's necessary in our view, and, and we made uh, some suggestions and recommendations in our opinion to further strengthen, strengthen the Commission's initial proposal and add further elements to clearly delineate the scope of the interference and add safeguards to ensure that it does not go beyond what is strictly necessary. For example, clarifying elements relating to categories of data, potential recipients, and the case in which reporting will take place, the role of the human review, etc. Now, the third and final point uh, um, I'd like to make relates to the role of technology, and this is this is what uh, Mallory was just talking about. This is an aspect we didn't discuss in our opinion, but it seems an inevitable part of the conversation going forward, especially if indeed uh, the Commission intends to require uh, online platforms or service providers from uh, using certain detection techniques in relation to what might otherwise be end-to-end -end encrypted communications. So we can already see blanket statements being made on both sides of the spectrum. And that's why we think it's important to have discussions such as this one, uh, like the one that we're having today uh, and the one that took place just a few days ago. And again, it, this is an issue which is by no means uh, limited to the issue of child sexual abuse material online. And I think that's the point that TJ was making as well. From a data protection perspective, it's clear that encryption plays an essential role in ensuring the security of personal data and the confidentiality of communications. And as EDPS, we have clearly stated in the context of the proposed privacy regulation that there should be no weakening of encryption by uh, way of introducing backdoors. But we also think it's important that in this debate, we stay nuanced and informed. Absolutist positions do not make sense. And we have to make sure that whenever a measure interfering with confidentiality of communications is deployed, it is properly legally framed. So as EDPS, we really look forward to continuing this debate with technical experts, with civil society, and also with law enforcement, so that whatever is developed in relation to this specific issue does not have broader consequences in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brendan. Very interesting and um, provoking, um, or I should say provocative um, contribution there, particularly in light of um, your point regarding legislating for something where the legislator is not, in fact, guaranteeing that what is being legislated for is something that could be done legally. And I think that is a point that we will have to come back to later in this discussion. But that takes us then finally on to um, Diego Naranjo, who I think will offer another critique of the proposal from a civil rights perspective. Diego, over to you. Yes, thank you. I hope you can uh, hear me besides the bad uh, video. Um, I, I think uh, I will connect with what uh, Brenda just said. Uh, in the last sentences, and also what you said TJ, before. And uh, I'm going to say that by quoting Commissioner Johansson, she was saying that uh, in one of the European News uh, uh, interviews she did this last year, that she said, we already scan for copyright content, we already scan for terrorist content, so why not preventing uh, challenges with, with the same technology? And to be fair, she has a point, and, and that's why we were, as a society, as every uh, opposing and scanning up what we get in the copyright directive, we still oppose uh, some of the measures in the terrorist content regulation. And we do that because it's, it, it, this is the slippery slope. First, we do it for one reason, then for the next, and then in the end, we will end up scanning all private conversations uh, and communications for any any other purpose. And we uh, completely have five sets of fundamental rights problems with the CISA Militia, both the, the short term and potentially the long term one, one is out. At uh, first, uh, it's a lack of clarity of services which are covered and the legal basis uh, that they use. And we know the recital of the internet regulation states that technologies uh, need to be the least inclusive in accordance with the state of the art. That is fine. But well, it is still not entirely clear, at least not to me, which specific services, platforms, applications, and technologies the Commission is referring when, when they say that the, the scope will include. Uh, technologies for the processing of press and another data, blah, blah, blah. So this is still very clear. And, and, and I was very concerned when, when then I, I got even more concerned when uh, you actually revealed that dating apps and video conferencing tools, I guess like this one, could come under the scope of the new uh, effort to monitor online communication. So perhaps we will be also scanned just in case that we, we need to find the uh, illegal material. And what well, the criticism, the second point from my side is the criticism from the EDPS and, the, and UNICEF. I won't repeat what Brendan said. On the UNICEF side, 
they they have clearly stated how uh, encryption benefits children by ensuring that they get protected sensitive information. They to talk to each other. They are sometimes even uh, age uh, uh, legal uh, sexual needs that they want to express with each other. So that will also affect them. And then UNICEF has said that any monitoring tools need to bear in mind the children's grown autonomy to exercise their expression and information rights. The third point is uh, we generally this normalization of scanning of communications. As I was saying, this is the first law of, uh, of uh, scanning everything just in case we need it for something. And the fourth point is uh, empowerment of big tech companies. Some of the measures that are proposed in this proposal are going to put again private companies in charge of surveillance and sensors mechanism that because the, the impact that they must have impact they can have on fundamental rights cannot be there by anyone else than public authorities. We cannot outsource law enforcement to Google and Facebook. We need to do it ourselves, even though it is hard from that. And specifically on, on the measures proposed, uh, and the, the stellar measure of the magic algorithm and this time, this has that basis. And I agree with the Brendan that we need a strong rule of law framework, including a, a safeguards for fundamental rights, for these uh, technologies in case they are legal, which I'm still not uh, completely sure. And if they are going to be proposed, they definitely need to be done with open source software so we can see how the algorithm works. They need to be controlled by public and independent institutions, and they need to be uh, under full public scrutiny and with uh, third party um, uh, uh, auditions. They need to be audited by third, third parties and not uh, using US technologies which are handled by US private organizations. And my final point, and my final, uh, final uh, concern is that this uh, general trend uh, that this interim regulation aligns with broader efforts to, to prevent encryption from being deployed or to undermine the, the current state of encryption. Not the technology itself, itself because we cannot break mathematics, but uh, generally is this trend that leads to one article in The Guardian say that Facebook uh, encryption plans could help child abusers escape justice. So this is the idea. We we don't want to break encryption. I'm sure Catherine will tell us that they don't want to break encryption, but it all flows in this. It is not about encryption, but it is somehow so a narrative I find it, uh, quite, uh, quite harmful in itself. I think I have a couple of minutes if, I, if, my, uh, if my phone uh, works correctly. So I'm, I'm going to go with a few uh, concrete requests. And uh, from the very beginning, since this uh, proposal was launched, we were, we were asking for data from Europol and national law enforcement authorities about the increase of, of abuses and the spread of this online during 2020 in Europe. I have not seen any data whatsoever. Uh, Catherine was uh, mentioning some uh, data that I think comes directly from Facebook. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but still, that is not clear. That's the, 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 well, we know that the, the reporting has decreased. We don't know if the, if the abuse, uh, the amount of material has decreased. Then uh, we would like to know, uh, we'd like to see data about the number of prosecutions and questions, both in the US and the, the European Union, as a result of these existing so called voluntary practices. I have not heard any data. We don't know if all of this scanning uh, works for any, if people are going, are taking to court or not. And uh, we would like to for this practice, both the previous one, the, what Catherine called the status quo, and the new ones to, to be reviewed by data protection authorities. And um, generally, uh, well, the lead the committee, the civil liberties committee in the European Parliament, uh, already gave a to-do list for the commission regarding the, it's a report on the implementation of the directive 2011-93 on combating sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children and child pornography. And three and now four years ago, and the, this, the civil liberties committee gave a, a long to do list of things to do uh, to be fair to, to member states, not to the commission, but it is the role of the commission as a guardian of the treaty to make sure that that is uh, done before proposing any other new proposals. And I'll leave it there for now. Great. Thank you very much, Diego. A lot of uh, material there to chew on. Um, I'm still waiting for questions to come in from the audience. So if you'd like to put a question to any member of our panel, please do so in the form on the right hand side on your web page. And um, in the meantime, I'll start the ball rolling with a couple of questions of my own, if I may, abusing my prerogative. Um, first of all, um, 
I'd like to put a question to Brendan regarding um, the compatibility of these systems which involve bulk scanning, so automated scanning of all communications on a certain platform, um, with the recent uh, line of authorities from the Court of Justice. So we saw the Court of Justice in um, Schrems, of course, condemn um, mass access to the contents of communications. Um, we've seen that modified somewhat in Privacy International and the Quattro Trudeau Net, where they talk about the conditions that have to be met in order to enable um, bulk interception. But what we seem to have here is a scheme which um, devolves the same sort of functionality to the private sector and aims to permit the private sector to do the same thing. So my question for you would be this, if we don't allow that in the context of state activity, can we do it indirectly by the state permitting private companies to do just that? Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, DJ, for that question. And, and it is something I would say that, 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 that we discussed also internally, and it, and it raises questions also, at what point does an interference, for example, become so significant that it would you know, start to touch on the essence uh, of certain fundamental rights? Now, we take this one legislative proposal at a time. Um, and so given that what was on the table, despite the fact that we're very concerned also about voluntary measures constituting interference, that was not the case yet with this proposal. And then indeed we have to look when we're doing a necessity and proportionality assessment, there's multiple different elements to be considered. One of course is the scope. How many people are affected? Uh, is it likely that individuals who are not potential suspects are going to be covered by the measures? What's the level of intrusiveness? What are, let's say, in this particular uh, case, what are the false errors? What are the false positives? What are the, what are the potential consequences for the individuals concerned? And that's why we differentiated, in our opinion, between, on the one hand, uh, um, um, tools uh, which have been developed for a long period of time, which enable detection specifically targeted of uh, confirmed instances of child sexual abuse or, or, or closely related thereto, versus, let's say, more um, open tools which would basically look to analyze conversations uh, of individuals either in text or, or, or orally, uh, where basically things would be picked up. Uh, we were looking at things like, you know, scanning to see if people are, are, are saying things like, you know, are you home alone? Where's your mom and dad? basically a, a much more wider range of potential uh, uh, indicators of potential crimes versus, you know, a straightforward indication of this is what we know is child pornography and there is really no uh, legitimate reason for that to be disseminated. And so that's, that's why uh, uh, we differentiated between those two. Thanks, Brendan. I have a question um, here which Okay. okay, sorry folks about that delay. I was just getting a notice there. Um, yes, um, we have one question um, coming in, which is why is there no um, child protection organization on the panel? And um, I suppose I can't answer that myself, but we do have the child protection view represented by the commission here. And if I can go back to Catherine with some of the uh, points that were made earlier on, I think listening to both Brendan and Diego, and in a slightly different direction, Mallory, they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying that there are very different forms of technologies associated here um, with these kind of proposals. Some of them run remarkable risks of false positives. And um, it's not entirely clear from their perspective just what is um, envisaged by this um, proposal. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you, TJ. Um, and I'll, while I will, of course, try to also represent the viewpoint of the child protection organizations, let me just caution you that as the commission, um, we're between the seats here. We really try to um, do justice to a number of competing rights, one of which is more in the foreground than this setting, of course, given the nature of this conference. And I cannot pretend to do justice to the requests from the other side, but let me just say on the UNICEF comments, uh, just to make sure that they're not misrepresented here, uh, the UNICEF chief uh, is putting a lot of pressure on this process to deliver the possibility for uh, organizations, for, for companies that seek to protect children using their services to continue to do so. So in other words, to detect when somebody is trying to groom children or to detect when materials depicting their abuse is being, is being shared. Um, 
So the objective of this proposal, TJ, as you were asking, is basically to maintain the status quo that we had until December 21st, and that despite the fact that this technology has been in use for, for almost a decade for a known content, has not really been um, the subject of a lot of debate before. Um, and that is basically to say that for a limited period of time, the rules of the GDPR continue to apply to the use of such technologies as they had before. We also added a number of safeguards and the main goal of this is really to give us time to come up with a solid long-term proposal incorporating the views that have been expressed here and also other views in that process. Now, um, when it comes to, um, I just want to counter any suggestion that the commission proposal in itself, uh, as was a bit suggested here, contravenes fundamental rights or um, is attempting in any way to ban encryption. Neither of those is true. And where jurisprudence from the Court of Justice is cited, let me just remind you that uh, what is referenced here comes from the data retention context, which is very different because it relates to indiscriminate um, retention of communications at the request or under obligation by a government. Here we are looking at a situation where companies have made a free choice that they do not want their systems to be used for the sharing of child sexual abuse or for the attempts to groom children into child sexual abuse. Um, that at the moment was their free choice and all we're trying to do here is to maintain that choice for a little bit longer. The proposal does not oblige any service provider to take any steps and the tools do not work in and to an encrypted environments. The proposal does not oblige anyone, uh, no company, to take any steps on end to end encrypted communications, just like it does not oblige any company to take steps on open conversations. I wonder, Catherine, can I press you a little bit in relation to one aspect of your answer there, which is that um, in relation to the exact tools that are proposed to be covered by this, because um, again, if we look at the particular concern expressed about, for example, text-based or keyword-based analysis or behavioral profile-based analysis, there's a concern that use of those tools is particularly risky. And um, I don't have a copy of the proposal in front of me, but um, if I recall correctly, the language used was in relation to well-established tools or words to that effect. And I'm just wondering if um, you would consider whether those kind of behavioral keyword based, for example, tools, i.e. tools going beyond um, matching hash values of photographs or videos, would you consider that those wider tools would be um, permitted by the proposal? So the proposal does not permit anything. The proposal just creates a derogation and whether the use of the tools is permitted then has to be judged under the GDPR. Just to be very clear on that, we do not create a legal basis. But that being said, um, the proposal covers known content, new content and grooming, and the technologies to detect all three, um, subject to the safeguards set out in the proposal, of course. And for new content and grooming, where naturally um, the technology cannot be as accurate as when it's just identifying one picture as being identical to a known picture, um, there is human oversight and human review of each of the hits. Um, at the company, at the national hotline that was being referenced, the National Center for Exploited and Missing Children in the US, and then again with uh, law enforcement in the jurisdiction from where the content was uploaded, if both of the first instances confirm that the content is criminal. Um, and that, in our view, um, provides the safeguard that mitigate the flaws in the technology. Uh, but again, the Commission takes no position on whether any specific technology complies with the GDPR because that is always subject to an individual assessment in the individual case and is not the competence of the Commission. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few related questions coming in, so perhaps we could consolidate them. And these are, uh, one of them is directed specifically to Mallory, so perhaps Mallory might answer first and then the others might jump in as well if they wish. Um, the questions are in relation to whether technologically speaking there are more effective, less intrusive measures that could be taken by companies and law enforcement authorities. And there's also a related question in relation to whether companies should be prioritizing um, the fight against known materials, sharing of known images, versus um, the fight against um, live abuse and the um, proportionality um, issues associated with that, if it is in fact the case 
that it is much easier to detect known images in a way that's less privacy intrusive. So Mallory, did you want to take um, a stab at answering these? Sure. Indeed, there are going to be variations in the approach and how privacy preserving that is. But I think we have to be very careful about referring to these as end-to-end -end encryption, that they preserve end-to-end -end encryption or they don't disrupt end-to-end -end encryption because they, they certainly do. And there are risks associated with that. Obvious one is the ability for um, two people or a group of people to communicate privately and confidentially without an uh, intermediary government, private sector, or um, an unknown adversary to see in. Um, I mean, I, I think the one thing that is important to keep in mind um, is just that the technology, the ability to create end to end encrypted systems exists. So even if the large platforms are disrupted, this technology will exist and it will be very easy to spin it up and use it, um, you know, to be to be more secure and private. So what happens then is you create a two tiered system where people who are tech savvy and that have a real motivation to hide will use end -to -end encrypted messaging where the rest of us who want to have private communications over easy to use and available platforms like the big tech companies will not. They'll have something that's maybe private communications, but it isn't really end-to-end -end encryption. And that's um, and something that we really need to worry about. And I think just to, and I'll, I know it's just a question, so I don't want to respond for too long, but one thing I feel is worth mentioning is that at any point where you want to moderate content, filter it, block it, something like that, you do really need some kind of human in the loop. There needs to be some kind of recourse. If a mistake is made, there needs to be a review process. And I mentioned this before, um, introducing new content into a sort of database is very high risk. Um, and, and that will obviously be a need. I mean, it isn't going to stay the same amount of the same hashed images forever. So there needs to be a human. And if there is a human, then that is effectively just simply not into encryption. There are people peeking in and, and that's not that's not um, zero harm, or that's not only being done computationally by by computers or AI. Um, there has to be a human in review, and that is where obvi they obviously then the private communication is broken. Thanks, Mallory. And I think that answers, in fact, the question that came through as you were speaking in relation to um, whether you can teach algorithms to recognise whether material is actually child sex abuse material and thus not proceed into monitoring conversations or messages of people who are innocent. So I take it from your um, statement that there is going to have to be a degree of human involvement in assessing any new um, image or any new video. And to that extent, therefore, the idea of protecting privacy in that way isn't going to be effective. Um, can I go back to um, Diego then in relation to another question which came in? And that is um, the question of whether or not data protection authorities and law enforcement um, should have more and dedicated resources and dedicated accountability evidence relevant to supervision to counterbalance the risks of such intrusive measures. As I understand it, the question here is if we're creating um, new forms of very general um, monitoring, does that need additional supervision mechanisms to be put in place? Um, but that's a good question. First, I, I would like to, to to propose, in fact, giving DPAs and LEAs the, the right amount of budget to do the work that they need to be doing. The DPAs already do not have it, and the law enforcement, from what I see, do not have all the uh, technology that they need to the workshop first. I think we would really need to give them the money to the budget to, to their work generally. Uh, and regarding specifically these tools, yes, of course, uh, I think as I was suggesting, uh, the, the tools that may uh, be used uh, in order to detect the uh, system, uh, they should be uh, first audited um, by the, the data protection authorities and ideally being, uh, uh, being able to be audited by external uh, experts as well. So they, they, they do need, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the means to do all of that properly. And, and currently that's not the case because they, they cannot even uh, do their regular work uh, nowadays. 
Thanks, Diego. That sounds very much like the position in re, uh, in relation to traditional surveillance, where um, we, under ECHR standards, require some form of um, external accountability mechanisms, preferably judicial oversight, to be in place. And it sounds like you're advocating something rather similar here. Um, mm -hmm. Catherine, I think you wanted to come in as well on some of those points. Yes, thank you. I mean, I couldn't agree more on the need for adequate resources on both sides, because I think that would be really helpful both on the side of the data protection authorities and on law enforcement. Of course, all of this is governed by um, the data protection directive on data uh, processing by the police. Uh, and of course, there's always, always um, a possibility for judicial oversight and complaints to the competent authorities, but I don't need to remind this audience of that. I just want to quickly come in on the point about the effectiveness of alternative measures because I think it is a really interesting one. Once again, I want to emphasize that this proposal is not about encrypted content. And in fact, as far as we know, these tools do not work on end-to-end -end encrypted content. So I think we're having a bit two conversations here and the proposal does not interfere with end-to-end -end encrypted communication in any way, shape or form. Um, what, what we have been asking companies is to tell us whether there are ways to, um, to uh, basically um, ensure child protection um, in, less in less invasive uh, ways. Um, and we have one live example that's currently uh, uh, in process. So there is a service that provides both an end-to-end -end encrypted and a, a non-encrypted communication service. Um, that service seeks to um, basically uh, preclude child abuse on both of its messenger services. Um, but what we see in practice is that uh, while we have uh, 12 million reports per year from one of the services, um, from the other service, there are reports in the low thousands. And I was just um, doing the math the other day, which means that uh, only 0.3% of reports from that company come from the end-to-end -end encrypted channel. That is, of course, a good news um, for <laughs> the perpetrators hiding their abuse in that end-to-end -end encrypted channel because, of course, they, they can feel safe there. Uh, nonetheless, the company bans users from the end-to-end -end encrypted service um, but doesn't have enough evidence to refer the cases to law enforcement. And that really, I think, leaves us in the worst of all positions where the victims are not being found and helped and at the same time, um, the, the service is discontinued perhaps on the basis of, of imperfect evidence. At least there is absolutely no certainty that the behavior was criminal in nature unless the, the individuals used child sexual abuse images as their profile pictures, which is where the thousands of, of hits per year come from, surprisingly. When it comes to prioritizing known content, um, indeed the algorithms are um, more reliable. Um, but the challenge here, of course, is that um, that the live abuse that's happening at the moment is often um, depicted in the new content and the only chance you have to actually sometimes prevent abuse from happening is when you try and detect grooming. And we actually have case examples from each and every one of the EU member states where grooming detection helped prevent further abuse. Um, so those technologies, while they always require human oversight and um, indeed verification of each of the suspected hits are very difficult um, to leave aside just because known content is easier to detect. Sorry about the technical glitch there, folks. Um, thanks, Catherine, for that. Um, Mallory, I think you wanted to come in there as well. Just really briefly to clarify where my comments are coming from. I'm not speaking about any particular proposal at all. I'm really just offering um, a technical view of a variety of different solutions that I've seen proposed in Brazil and India and the UK and the EU. So I know that this is an EU audience, but I do think that speaking generally about the constraints and the risks from a technical perspective can be helpful. So it isn't a misread of, of, of your particular proposal. It's it, I think it's relevant to the conversation, trying to answer the questions as best I could. But, and I also just want to note that from a technical perspective, this is not about child sexual abuse material because there is nothing technically that defines that that is something that you can filter, block, trace, 
uh, capture and not any other kind of content. So the same kinds of techniques that have been introduced like client-side scanning or hashing databases or AI detection, all of that could be done from a technical perspective on any kind of content. And so I'm not really focusing very much on that at all, um, but I do hope that my sort of technical view on these proposals is, um, you know, additive to the discussion. Thanks, Mallory. Um, Catherine, I have another question coming in here that you might like to um, take a look at. Uh, the question is this, how can the Commission justify that it knowingly allows chat messages and other electronic communication of European citizens to be screened and evaluated by foreign organisations? With your proposal, you even want to allow this infringement to continue. So again, we're not allowing anything. We're not creating a legal basis and where practices are incompatible with the GDPR, they were incompatible before the 21st of December and they would continue to infringe the GDPR. Uh, that's not something that we're legitimizing in any way, shape or form. And of course, that also includes Title V of the GDPR when it comes to international transfers. Um, let me just react to what Mallory just said also um, about the specificities. Of course, technically speaking, any technology can be told to detect any given content. And the difference here is the legal side of things. Um, technology is neutral. The question is how we employ it. And the difference with child sexual abuse is that material is illegal regardless of context. And once again, we are not currently advocating for any scanning and end-to-end -end encrypted communications. This proposal, just to be very clear, is not about that. Um, sorry, Mallory, to clarify again, because you keep speaking about the Commission proposals in this area, and I have no idea because there is no such proposal. And in contrast to perhaps other third regions, we don't actually have the same standards. We do have the Charter in place and the GDPR and e-privacy, which we're not trying to recuse any providers from. Thank you. Thank you, Aston. I think one of the areas of con one of the areas of concern here is that um, we are, even if not explicitly um, permitting something, nevertheless we're taking away some of the obstacles that would prevent it from happening. Um, but I think Brendan wanted to come in there also. Brendan? Uh, yes, thank you very much. And, and I think it's kind of uh, um, along the along the same vein. So 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 we do take the point uh, or the argument that's being raised um, that basically what the proposal tries to do is is is, is to preserve the status quo. Um, but in, on the 20th of December, there was an extension of the scope of the telecommunications framework, electronic communication services, and therefore also with the intended protection of the confidentiality of those communications. And so uh, for me, the fact that something was uh, uh, potentially outside of the scope or was outside of the scope uh, of the protection uh, that's normally afforded to otherwise confidential communications, there was a clear intention of the legislator to extend that protection to functionally equivalent services. And so the fact that certain uh, things, uh, certain practices without that additional protection of confidentiality were taking place prior to the entry into application of the electronic communications code doesn't change the fact that what we're talking about now is enabling automated analysis of otherwise protected communications. I, I do think that there's a valid point that some of these things have been going on for a long time and there's a question as to to what extent should have these uh, practices been scrutinized more uh, more carefully under GDPR, under the Data Protection Directive. I think that's a fair point. I think it also ties into the question of resources. But in any case, I, I, I do think that, you know, as we're trying to demystify what we're talking about here, we also need to keep that in mind. Thanks very much, Brendan. Um, we really don't have a lot of time left, so perhaps if anybody has a short comment that they'd like to make just by way of wrap up, we could take it now. I just have a point on, on Brendan's very valid point. Indeed, I, I couldn't agree more. This is a decision of the co-legislator uh, and only the co-legislator can decide whether or not um, there is to be an exception from that decision. And that's what we're asking them at the moment. Um, only the legislator can can take that Thank decision. Thank you very much. And I think we have um, more or less reached the end of our time. So once again, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for a very interesting discussion. I'd like to um, thank our friends at KU Leuven for actually organizing this panel. And um, I look forward very much to hopefully having um, similar conversations with you this time next year in person and not on this slightly glitchy platform. 
So with that, I think we can wrap it up there. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, TJ. Thanks all.